What's good, everybody? Uh, I just want to say before that we get into this episode, uh, one of my dear friends, Jason Klinker, has been diagnosed with testicular cancer. And uh, I think it's important that I, um, I guess, announce that because I want everybody to add him to your prayer list um, or let, you know, people who, you know, pray at your church, let them know about this. Um, and then maybe we can, uh, I'm trying to think of plans and things to do to, uh, to lift his spirits uh, because he was a water boy for Dover when I played for Dover. And uh, his dad uh, was one of my coaches. And I respect that family dearly. His mom was uh, one of my music teachers, too. Um, so I think it's very important that uh, we add him to the prayers uh, that we do. Um, and uh, we just, I guess, recognize um, that a young a young guy like Jason, I, I want to say 24 or 25, has been, um, you know, diagnosed with something so um, so scary. And uh, we just want to lift his spirits and make sure, you know, we're sending positive uh, energy his way. And also uh, with this episode, we will be touching on uh, some of my mental issues that I had in my playing career. And uh, but I want you to stay tuned for more details, a deep dive into these uh, mental issues. Uh, I d- I'm doing a podcast with Natalie Bolin uh, from the Adams, Adams Board, and uh, those will be coming soon. Uh, so stay tuned to those on the Get Level Podcast um, Network uh, or the Get Level Pod uh, YouTube channel. What's good, everybody? Uh, welcome to 99 Miles Per Hour with me, your host, Percy Garner. Uh, I'm excited. I got a special guest today. We're continuing the, uh, I guess, the professionals from Percy's past uh, theme. <laughs> but uh, before I do uh, introduce our special guest, I would like to um, just remember to I guess I'll tell you guys to respond to um, a lot of the questions I send through Facebook. If we have a local um, guest and also leave a actually there was a five star review. So I have to read it and I'm going to read it off memory or maybe we'll just add it in. You'll look it up. okay? Uh, but we do like that. We do appreciate that. We appreciate the feedback. Uh, any five star rating is going to help us. And if you review it, then I'll, I'll read it on uh, the episode, the next episode. You got it. Dang, that was fast. Look at you. Last time we tried to do this, it was bad. <laughs> All right. So the uh, five star review was uh, August 19th. So I'm a little late, but it is from AF Tank. And uh, I like it. It's called the title was Hidden Gem. So tuned in to see my old school high school buddy, Nate Ames. This podcast is just uh, like enjoying a conversation in your own living room. Nice. Easy to get sucked in into the banter and jokes. Uh, grew up in Dover, but it, I am currently in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. So I got to see Percy pitch a couple times with the Iron Pigs. Yay, yay. Always good to see the hometown locals doing great things. Glad I came across this. Appreciate it, AF Tank. <laughs> What a name there. But uh, yeah, so uh, just make sure you listen to all the other podcasts on the Get Level Pod Network. Uh, that is getlevelpod.com. And that is enough of that. Uh, I want to introduce our next guest. So I know her because of, uh, I guess, us working together while she was with the Cleveland Indians. Uh, she was our mental coach uh, or whatever you want to call it. Mental coach is that the problem? Okay. Uh, therapist. No, <laughs> she said, no, no, no. Um, but, uh, she, you know, worked hand in hand with me to what we're going to be talking about. And that's helped get over, uh, you know, some, some mental issues that I have had and that I've been sharing, uh, throughout the, the past years, once I got out of baseball, but now, uh, she is back with, uh, the military, the army, the army. Yes, and that's who she was with before the Cleveland Indians, and uh, she's very experienced. She was, uh, I felt bad because she had to put up with me a lot, but uh, I think she enjoyed it, and uh, just so you guys know, she is, uh, w- like, joining us through where in South Carolina? North Carolina. Right North here Carolina. Brad, yep. Okay, North Carolina, sorry. But <laughs> introducing uh, C.C. Clark, but you're married now. What is your maiden name? <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so CC craft, CC craft. Okay. Great intro guys. I I'm really happy <laughs> with that one, but no, I'm just glad that we got to introduce you. And, uh, I guess, um, 
like what I told you before is a lot of people know Tito. They know um, the the staff that way. Sandy Alomar, obviously, everyone in Ohio loves yeah. Sandy Alomar, but they don't get to to see the uh, the people behind the scenes doing a lot of uh, of work to help the players go out in the field and perform every day. So we did the interview with Ken, and now we got Cece here, and hopefully we can share some of the things she was able to do in her career, even outside the Indians. So. I guess I just want to ask, you know, how you're doing. You said you just celebrated your one year anniversary. Uh, so like, where are you at with your mind? Um, it's been really interesting. This last year has been the transition out of baseball and back to working within the special ops population here at Fort Bragg. And, and that definitely has been a, a life change. Um, baseball is amazing. I, I love the six years I got to spend working with the major league team. Uh, what an amazing organization, what an amazing group of guys. Um, I felt really lucky in that and just how, how phenomenal that experience is. But as you know, better than anybody else, um, baseball is eight months of full go. And so if I was lucky, I would get home five days out of the month. And that seemed like a really tough way to start a marriage. And I've have a very strong value for, for family. And, and so, um, it was great to have an opportunity to come back home, work with such amazing people, getting to work with soldiers here and get to see my husband most nights. Um, <laughs> so I've been lucky within my field and that it has flexed with me during my life. Um, you know, when I wanted to get after it and really go into professional baseball, I had the opportunity. So who knows what the future holds, but been super thankful. Uh, and it's been pretty amazing. Well, it sounds like you got a lot of gratitude and, uh, you know, not everybody's lucky to have a job that uh, is flexible, but, um, you know, you, you chose a career that you love and that you're able to, you know, I guess, uh, do in multiple different uh, locations. And I know baseball, is it was great, but, you know, working in the military, that's got to be a whole nother level. I know baseball players have to perform and you got to get us ready for, to do that, but military and stuff like that, that is a whole different beast. Um I guess just uh, if you can, I guess, talk about, I guess, the differences, not like pros and cons, Mm -hmm. but (laughs) just how intense is it, I guess, uh, working in this field in the military? So, I I mean, the field of sports psychology or mental performance has grown a lot. When I was in grad school, they used to say there were four full-time applied positions where you were like working with performers and all of those belong to the U.S. Olympic Committee. Um, it's ballooned, right? And so the um, military really started hiring and is actually one of the leading hires for mental performance coaches uh, in the U.S. And it has programs across the country to support soldiers and their performance and resiliency. Um, and it's amazing that as soldiers are, I mean, to work around a group of individuals that's that's dedicated and willing to sacrifice. Um, and obviously, um, the place they're trying to perform is, you know, no, it's life or death. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's a really amazing experience to support. Um, and the guys, and, and I've gotten to work in the green Beret population, the special forces population a lot. And that's a, that's a really amazing, um, population to get a, to work around. So wow. very thankful lifelong friends came out of the first time I got to go work there. And, and it's fun to return back to such a beautiful area in North Carolina, Um, but one of the hard parts about it is you don't get to see game day, right? It's not like I can deploy (laughs) with the guys and see what they see. And so, um, one of the really rewarding things about working in baseball was a club with, you know, 300 or less players, um, 70 ish coaches. I could know everybody. I could watch games. I could be there, um, right after a game to talk to somebody, uh, there are some amazing points of really getting to see a performance all the way through and then even having the results every night to, to, to work off of. And so baseball is both, I think, a, a tough sport in that you guys play every night. And so there's not like a week of practice where you can play with something before you guys take the mound um, or take the field. Uh, but it's also pretty amazing in that it gives you kind of daily results um, to really take performance seriously. And so I was really lucky um, to, to have the opportunity to work with the Cleveland Indians. I can't imagine a better club to have gotten to work for. Um, and I think a huge part of that is the players and just the caliber of, um, men I got to work around there because it really was an amazing group of players throughout my entire time there. Yeah. So, I mean, we were a family, I guess we could say it. And I I think that's what helped us have that, that run that we did. 
Um, but yeah, that's, that's gotta be a, a dynamic that most of us can't really, I guess, think about is, uh, yes, baseball, you're able to get the results. And, and that's, that's something I never would have thought about. You're not going out there like, Oh, you know, nice shot. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, yeah. And I can even remember the transition into baseball. I think it was my first full spring which would have been the 2015 season. And we struggled coming out of the gate and we had struggled the year before. And Tito came to check on me because it was my first, you know, time breaking camp with the team. Um, 2014, I was hired in May. So I never, I didn't break camp. I came in kind of right before the draft. Um, 2015 was my first time spending that spring. And Tito came and checked on me and said, Hey, you know, I know it's tough when the team's losing. I just want to check on you and see how you're doing. And I was still fresh enough out of working for the army that I remember saying, well, everyone's alive and no one's getting shot at. I'm fine. Like, and that was really my perspective. I don't think I totally transitioned into baseball to realize, you know, a tough, a tough April can have a lot of effects. Yeah. I don't think I had totally gotten that yet. Yeah. Um, if you're allowed to, uh, has, uh, how has COVID affected, I guess, your, your dealings uh, in being over there and in North Carolina and how's that been, I guess, how's the army handling it? How are you guys handle it? Uh, I mean, just talk yeah, about that. Without getting too in depth. I mean, what I'd say is um, the army has to stay prepared and has to, I mean, it's a really unique place and that um, we still have to be able to deploy soldiers. We still have to be able to get soldiers home. And so the army has done a really good job of trying to figure out like what are the best practices or what are ways we can continue to do this because um, the world is continuing to turn and soldiers have their on deployment cycle still, um, special forces soldiers are deployed all throughout, uh, the world, both in keep peacekeeping missions and all kinds of things. And so, um, it's continued to move as safe as possible. And uh, I can't speak on behalf of the army. I have no right to, I'm just yeah. consulting, kind of contracting for them, but, um, but continue to work, continue to figure it out. Nice. Uh, a lot of stuff going to online for us, which has been really interesting and a unique challenge. I'm sure you've come across some of it, even with podcasts is yes. how do you transmit stuff um, when you can't do it in person? Yeah. I was going to say, I guess that's, uh, I mean, a lot of your job from what I experienced with you was, is talking. Um, but I mean, I guess it's different when you're in person, it's good to know, you know, you're not being recorded or anything like that. It's a little hard to, I guess, uh, trust that a little bit when, when you're over the internet and you know, you never know what's going on. But, um, I think it's, it's huge to know that the, uh, the military, you know, take pride and value, uh, you know, mental, you know, preparation. And I guess having a staff that is dedicated to that. And I guess, preparing these uh, soldiers and what they have to do every day. Obviously it's not what the average person has, but everyone has their, their issues and they're on different scales and, and obviously at different lengths, but everyone still has mental issues. And for the military to value this, I think it's something, you know, and it's creeping into sports, but I think it's something that, you know, everyone should uh, take notice. And uh, obviously you know, the army, they probably already have a lot of technology that comes to them before us. And then we get the the leftovers, but we see what's important and what the, the soldiers need. So I think it's something that I'll, we obviously should, um, you know, take note of and say, you know, maybe we should, you know, pay attention to this more. And I think we are, but you know, what's your opinion on where with the direction that the world or the United States is going when, uh, you know, when we talk about mental health? You know, I think we're, we're learning. Um, I was speaking with a, with an old friend that actually, um, is the director for Auburn's program. Um, he's amazing. And he, he worked for the army for 1.2. And, um, so just to, to clear the air, there are all kinds of different backgrounds that work on mental performance. So the person that runs Auburn's program, his name's Adrian. So he is a licensed, um, psychologist, uh, and he's a mental performance or certified mental performance consultant. So he's got both a CMPC and a licensure for psych. Um, and so he's doing both of that, the, those things for the student athletes there. And one of the things he was presenting is you can have really high functioning individuals that right now are not in great mental health. You can have really mentally healthy individuals that are not necessarily performing. Right. And so there's this piece sometimes where I think we see high functioning individuals 
and we assume that they must be healthy. Um, but if you consider for something, for example, like bodybuilding and where people are at when they're in competition, um, they also oftentimes are really careful about not being around other people because they could get sick very easily. Their immune systems are fairly compromised. So they're not the most robust health health wise at that point. Um, but they are in amazing shape and they're ready to show. Right. And so I think sometimes we assume high performance equals balance or robustness or mental health or physical health. And that's not always the case. So going along with that disclaimer, my background is as a mental performance coach. So I don't do any clinical work. Um, so one of the amazing things with the Indians was, um, both having the Cleveland clinic right nearby, which was absolutely phenomenal in terms of mental health resources. And then also the director, Charlie Marr was a licensed psychologist. And so the ability to refer to him or to Cleveland clinic was really amazing. Um, but part of where I got to come in and both with the army and, um, with the Indians is really a focus on what helps you guys perform. Um, and helps you guys do that consistently under stress at a really high level when expectations are incredibly high for you. And so we really take a lot of our modeling on what helps people be elite and how do we create those habits and help you understand the way the body's built to help you perform and be elite. But there are mm -hmm. some people that are licensed in our field and they're uh, as clinical psychs. And there are some people that are certified as uh, mental performance consultants and they're technically two different certifications. So kind of okay. like your athletic trainer and your strength coach. Yeah. Oh, okay. I like uh, you make it easy to understand with that, <laughs> with that example. Appreciate that. Um, man. So, I mean, obviously when you're talking about mental performance and obviously I take, I, t I value that now I didn't necessarily value it. Um, you know, in high school or college. Sure. Um, but that's just, you know, ignorance, not a lack of knowledge. Uh, but like, it's so intriguing. And I, I just want, I'm trying to figure out like what made you, you know, make, as a young girl, like, you know what, I want to, you know, how can I, you know, increase my mental performance or just what, what made you kind of want to go into that field or was it a late decision? No, I played soccer um, all growing up. I had years of soccer I loved. I had years of soccer I struggled with, probably like a lot of people. Um, I had a crazy, awesome experience of getting to play high school football. I got to be a place kicker. Um, really? I did not know that. I know all kinds of goofiness. Well, and you know, with place kickers, you, they all talk about whether or not, you know, you're, you're, you're mentally tough or whether you're losing yeah, it, right? You can, yeah. It's another, another place you can have yips. Yes. Um, but then, um, in college, I, I think I really started to realize how much my mentality um, played into my level of my game at any given point. And, and I had two, a visiting professor and then a, um, another professor at, at Bates College that were both, both had backgrounds in sports psychology. And they were amazing about just exposing me to it. And so like an early study I got to help with was just having people do the same task, but telling one set of group, one group of people they had to, you wanted them to get better every time and telling another group of people they were competing against others. And then you told both groups that they were not doing well, they were losing every time or they were, they were not getting better and who would persevere. Mm. And so just realizing like by setting, setting different conditions, um, we impacted perseverance and motivation. And wow. so you think about it, like what's the thing you carry with you always your brain. What's yeah. the first thing you come into your day with your attitude or your mindset? Um, special forces or special operations has a um, adage of the human is more important than the hardware. Mm. So no matter how much you outfit a soldier with all the cool stuff, the human is still more important. Um, and I think that that's such a, to me, that speaks to my core of, um, I can rig you up to any technology on a baseball field. It's still you. Yeah. So you matter. Mm, I like it. Um, see, that's, I love, I'm, that's, I'm so glad I had you on this show. Cause I feel like obviously the shows, I love to take advantage of doing this podcast. It's fun. Um, and I, obviously I want, you know, my viewers to, to learn uh, about every type of different thing there is out there, but I also learn as well. So, um, I also want to kind of get in, I guess, to what we were talking about, uh, on the phone this morning and get back to the, the Indians and, and how we, I guess, work together to solve one of my issues. Now, on my podcast that I'm doing with Natalie, uh, uh, the Adams Board, we're kind of digging into that. And uh, just to uh, 
so I don't just start going into what we're talking about uh, just to give a little background. So I had, I guess, mental struggles dealing with expectation and performance and um, just trusting, you know, that all the the movements that my body has done over the years since I was nine. Uh, and I just struggled with that and performing at, at a high level, uh, basically because of myself and w- the pressure that I put on myself. Uh, so once I was out of the denial stage, then the, the Indians, <laughs> uh, we kind of partnered together and luckily we had, they cared about it be- enough to, to have a staff in place and we weren't running around looking for someone to, <laughs> you know, come fix Percy. So, uh, luckily CC and, you know, we had Brian and, uh, a lot of others there to help, but I, I did a lot of one-on-one time with, with CC. And, uh, um, I guess that's one of the main reasons I wanted to have her on the show, obviously share her, her background, but just kind of bounce things back and forth on what, what we did, uh, and how we attacked, uh, my, my issue. And basically expectation was the main thing. Um, so when you were tasked with fixing Percy, like what was your, what were your initial (laughs) thoughts of, all right, this is going to be a fun challenge or, oh crap, this is my first Yips victim. So, (laughs) So, um, this is such a unique situation Percy, to get to talk to you on this podcast about it, because one of probably a core tenant of anyone working in mental performance, um, is that, uh, we're very protective over our clients and your confidentiality is a really big deal. And so, you know, if you, if you hear me on any podcast, I generally say, we'll not talk specifically about any player, any soldier, any, you know, we, we work really hard to make sure that, um, what we may be trying to put information out that could help others. Uh, we never exposing someone that's worked for us because your privacy is really important, your trust, um, and our integrity behind that. But since you're asking, it's such a neat (laughs) chance to actually get to talk about your experience because it's yours to share. Um, so Um, I think, I think even Percy, one of the things that's cool is you and me getting to connect went well before your problem, which was such an amazing thing that the Indians did is that I got to be around you a lot. And so the first day you were asked to speak to me or trust me was not the first day you and I had talked, right? Um, I I got to see you the minute the, the organization acquired you. Um, you've always had your amazing smile and charisma and so I had gotten to watch you play. I had gotten to watch you. I knew when we acquired you that you were working through some command stuff. Um, I got to watch you grow and develop and, and, and support you and cheer you on just for being who you were for a while before, um, before you ever had, came into kind of an obstacle. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's a really important part of things because I think it's really hard when an emergency happens to call into someone and also trust them, like you said, to go searching for someone and not, not know if they know who you are or your background or anything about you. And then also kind of try to divulge everything. Yeah. Um, but even so I think in, um, when, when you first started struggling, I mean, I think one of the hard things particularly surrounding Yips is it's got an aura and a story, um, that a narrative that exists in baseball and it scares a lot of people. And so I can remember both, the club having concerns for you, um, and, and, and kind of the rumblings of, oh my gosh, someone might have the yips. Um, and it's you and you were throwing so well and so hard and you were so dynamic and so amazing. And all the stats looked so good on you. Um, and so fear of, you know, someone with so much potential and us and, you know, losing out for what you could perform at. And then I remember you initially coming in and the first couple sessions, I felt terrible that I couldn't provide a quick fix. I didn't have fairy dust for what was going on. And I think. (laughs) Darn it. Why didn't you? (laughs) Right. I wish they'd given that to me with my degree and my certification, but they did not. Um, And I think, and I, and I could feel that you really wanted, like you just wanted this to be over. And so I think it took, you know, a little while for us to kind of settle into the work. Yeah, it definitely did. But the, the, like you said, the good thing was that I was, you know, talking to Cece who I've already seen, all of 2015 and you know a lot of times because you you did a good job of going around and not just staying in Cleveland with the 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 important guys (laughs) but uh but I was already you know obviously comfortable talking with you and 
Um, before it was just, you know, banter and just getting to know each other and our backgrounds. And, and then, so it was very easy to escalate to, you know, Hey, we need to attack this issue immediately. So, uh, that was very, very, um, at the time I didn't think about that. I just was like, yo, CC, come on, let's go. Let's do it. You know, <laughs> but well, it's a I, struggle. I think that's kudos to you too, Percy. Cause I remember, you know, I think it's hard when the performance shows up on the field. And so uh, you're kind of voluntold in my office. Um, and that can be a hard situation and there can be resentment there. Um, and you were always super open and super willing. And I think there were times where you were more bought in or less bought in, but you were always willing to give it a shot and you were there when you needed, you were supposed to be there. And that provided us a space to at least work within, which was, which was huge. Yeah. And, and, and I don't think everyone would have done it. Yeah. And that you're accurate at that with the, the sometimes I was more bought in and sometimes I wasn't. Cause that's even when I think the first time I went in, I was just confused. I thought it would be, I would have to say, all right, I want to talk to CC, but it was more like, Hey, I was like, dang, okay. They're, they know what's going on. <laughs> I thought, cause I'd been so good at masking it before, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but yeah, it was, it was definitely something new. And I was like, okay, let's at a certain point, I had a point where like, we, we got to tackle this. Um, you know, I'm getting old. No, I'm <laughs> Such a bad term in baseball. Of course you were not at all. Old. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's what? 26, 27, but that's, that's in baseball years, you know, I should have already had my, my contract by then. No, <laughs> but, you um, were becoming into your prime around that. Yes. Yes, I was. Um, but a, another thing I want to talk about is without going into specifics and naming names, I, I definitely want to give props to, you know, um, while well, I'll name certain players names, but like the organization, I won't talk about, you know, them, but I, I just want to basically state how important it was and how they went about it visibly to me, um, made a world of difference. I think, uh, other clubs, it, it may have gotten worse or just been a issue for longer and with no hope. Uh, but the way, um, obviously you and the, 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 the Indians, just the way they handled it, it just gave me so much hope, um, that, okay, this is going to be over soon and I can get back to normal. Um, that made a big impact, especially with me w be willing to buy in, uh, to our, our sessions and stuff like that. That, that was definitely something, um, that definitely made an impact uh, on me. I think there were amazing conversations on all sides. You and I talked this morning a little bit about, um, Yips is one of those things that if you Google it, and if you Google people that can help with Yips, there are all kinds of people that say they can fix it in 45 minutes. There are I people that, that you know, want <laughs> 10 sessions for a $500 a piece. Um, and one of the things when you came in, Percy, that, that I'm happy to disclose is here you have this amazing guy that's been easy to root for, that you've watched excel in his career, that you've loved cheering for, has made it easy to support him. And and you're stumbling and Yips is such a unique issue. And, and I don't think anyone has like the, the perfect magic sauce on how to fix it. And so, um, it's a really humbling experience as a practitioner to try to work with somebody, because I also think how you're experiencing that issue, you know, it's a little bit like someone struggling with their mechanics, how you're going to work through fixing that and your path is going to be unique to you. And so it was both an honor to get to know you so much better during that time. And for you to let me in on, on things that played for you, fears that you had, um, concerns that you had, it was really amazing. I thought the way that the club tried to both balance, how do we best support Percy, um, and be aware of, um, the club, the players, the teams, and make sure that that's all going forward too. But they really, spent a lot of time and, and there were a lot of conversations, um, and, and, and openness to, we don't have a perfect science or recipe to this. And so we're all going to really talk and get together and collaborate and do the best by this amazing individual that we are lucky to have in our club as we can. Um, I, I told you this morning, I still think about you and reflect on it. And, and I don't, I still don't have a perfect answer for how to work someone through the yips. I don't have a textbook that I could write, 
Um, I learned a lot working with you. Um, I reached out to different people working with you um, and expanded my scope of what I would, you know, who, who I would think of as being helpful people for a soldier or for soldier, for a player. <laughs> um, and, and I think it's hard, you know, we, I use the analogy this morning, like I felt like with you, we, we were peeling back onion layers and the hard thing in baseball is you both have a clock ticking by like when you have to have these onion layers peeled, peeled back by. Um, and you were having kind of successes and hardships throughout, you know, with throwing a baseball too. And so I think there were moments where you were throwing well, where you just wanted to be over. And if you never had to come to my office again, it would probably be a lovely thing because then it would mean that you were fixed. <laughs> yes. And I know you felt that way. And, <laughs> and then there were days where um, probably the office was a great place to be because you know, the ball wasn't flying somewhere and it was a place to relax. Yes, um, for sure. <laughs> but I think we all wish we could snap our fingers and fix behavioral components, whether that's high performance or behavioral health. And, and it's not, it's a lot of work and it oftentimes is a roller coaster and there's sometimes one step forward and two steps back. And so really getting to live that with you, um, was an honor and it was, um, I wish, I wish I could say that I could snap my fingers and I had the cure for all yes and have a great business, but, yeah. um, but I don't think that's what it is. And, and I also think even the people who have been able to overcome it, I feel like they probably aren't able to pinpoint, oh, this one thing I did was it, you know, and that's, that's the struggle. And what we talked about this morning is probably there's maybe hundreds of ways that can probably help an uh, individual, yeah. but it depends on the individual. And that's, that's where the, the wild card comes in. Yeah. And I think, I think you hit the nail on the head. You know, I think it's a building process. I think the person, the player that's involved in it is a huge part of the foundation of that building process. And then I think there's steps along the way. And I do think a key ingredient is people willing to work, but you and I were talking about too. Um, one of my held beliefs about the yips is that people airmail balls all the time. They miss throws all the time, but there's something about when that incident occurs that's um, almost traumatic in terms of the way the brain has stored that airmailed ball that um, doesn't let you forget it. And so the next time you go to throw a ball, it's the what if. And so, you know, again, we were talking this morning and using the example of um, the difference between just signing your signature and then really trying to sign like the perfect signature. You're taking something that has been procedural and automatic for you for years. You've been doing it since you were nine. And now you're really consciously trying to control it. And it doesn't go well, right? You're taking something that is generally not very conscious, very automatic, and you're making it very conscious. How do you raise um, your <laughs> The other goofy example I have is like, a pickup line, you know, you talk to people all the time and then you try to walk up to a girl in a bar or a boy in a bar and you can't get out your first name, <laughs> but you talk every day. <laughs> exactly. I don't have that issue, but no, <laughs> <laughs> well, you've been married for a while. So. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, that is true. That is true. But, uh, yeah, those are great, you know, analogies or examples to, to help people understand what it's like. And I want to say, because I would constantly think about, especially when I wasn't playing, I was just watching other people play more watching other people uh, pitch is what I kind of would watch and kind of envy. Like some of these players mm -hmm. were just so free. And at certain points I felt so like, you know, constricted, bottled up. I felt like paralyzed at certain points where I'm just like, Oh, what am I doing? But the biggest thing is, uh, this is the way I felt. I'm trying to describe it. I had it in my head. It's, it's almost like you just, you feel like Space Jam and that there was a, a baseball that the Monstars, you put, they took all your powers away and you're just like, I don't even know how to pitch anymore. And yeah. uh, that, I mean, that's, I, I, I think that's the, the greatest analogy I can uh, come up with is, is the, the, the Space Jam one. And it just feels so awkward. And you're like, I don't know how to throw anymore. Um, yeah. But, yeah, no, I love that. And I think too, like when we looked at what happened, like you talked a little bit about um, really trying to control how you were throwing. So you were this guy that just unleashed this velocity and going from that being the mentality and that being your mechanics to, I really just need to make sure that I throw this for a strike. It's really different ways to think about stuff. And I think um, 
our brains are set up to help us survive, right? We are built to remember negative things better than we are built to remember positive things because the most important thing to your brain is that it keeps you alive. Yes. It's not built as a performance mind, right? Our brain wasn't built to make us perform. And so when you've had that negative, negative experience, your brain is saying, Percy, get off this baseball field. It's a danger to our ego. It's a danger to, to you. You don't have to do this. This isn't essential to survival. G- get off here. Yeah. Right. It, it's, it's kind of screaming that in some way, shape or form. Um, and you're trying to perform. And so it's, it's a really interesting place where I, I do feel like too, um, almost kind of biologically and how we're built, that's like an anchor or it's like the monsters like <laughs> hanging on to your stuff because at least if they hang on, hang on to your stuff, you're not entering into a really competitive baseball or basketball game, right? Yeah. You're just, you can kind of sit out and say, Hey, I can't do this anyway. Um, and I, I, I think it's part of how your brain protects you yeah. in a really strange way. Yeah. And I, I think that's a, it's a good way. It reminds me of the, the movie Crudes, you know, the caveman back in the day. I don't know if you watch that, but with my kids, I watch it. So, <laughs> but I mean, that's, that's where we develop these, you know, defense mechanisms, mechanisms, yeah. you can call them. But, um, another thing I did want to touch on is the thing that where we went after uh, a certain point, And I know you had some, um, some recommendations where you, you know, you knew where I could go, whatever. Ultimately I did chose to choose the Orioles and that wasn't, um, uh, I'm not saying that's a decision that I fully regret. I love the Orioles. They had a great staff there. Um, but I just think at the time I thought I chose, I made the right decision off for me for my, and I just wanted to forget it all after what we did. And, and I think, uh, there could have been some success made, uh, in this, uh, especially outside when I went to the Cleveland clinic, but I just feel like I didn't always fully buy in. And, and I think that's something that is maybe a part of the whole thing. If I fully buy in and fail, then, uh, you know, <laughs> then it's that's even such worse. That's a hard one though too, Percy, because I feel like fully buying in is also fully admitting that it, it is a problem at the level it was. And one of the things that you did well is survived. And so you ebbed and flowed out of competing and pitching. You were competing in live games. Yeah, I don't know um, how. <laughs> you had you had good moments. Um, you know, and so there were these moments where maybe you didn't have to face this. Maybe it wasn't so bad. Maybe you could just go back to normal. And I think um so fully buying in also would have been saying, okay, no, this, this is here. I have to fully buy in to kind of um I don't want to say like a treatment because that doesn't seem right, but like uh, you would have had to fully buy into, to it being very real. Yeah. Um, I think part of me was, didn't want to say this is real. This is real. (laughs) um, You just kind of want to wake up. Right. And like, and you talked about it, like even like the feeling of like moving clubs, maybe I can just start over and turn the page. Um, But I think, yeah, we talked about um, a couple things. Uh, One of the things that Cleveland clinic um, has is, Uh, I don't know if they call it holistic medicine or Eastern medicine, but they actually have a whole setup there. And so one of the things I did get to talk to, um, one of the people I got to talk to there was both a a licensed counselor and a hypnotist. And it was really interesting. Um, I kind of got to do an informational interview and check in with how she would have viewed YIPS to see if it aligned and um, more aligned enough that we, you know, both that I wasn't doing any harm to you, frankly, and also that uh, if we were both working with you, that we would be mutually supportive. And I really thought she brought some interesting, um, skill sets and capability to, to supporting you. And so I was both deeply thankful for Cleveland to being open to that yes. and, yes. um, the clinic for having that type of resource and for you with your openness. Um, and I thought it was an interesting Avenue and I, I just, again, such an amazing guy and I wanted to support. And so, how could I bring resources to you? And as long as they didn't cause detriment to the work, you know, we were doing, yeah. um, and not the more the merrier, but, but yeah, if I could bring people in that were going to help you, I felt like that was, that was really huge. And even after you left the Indians, my hope for you was finding as many support assets as possible. Yeah. And there, I still went and seen her after, uh, the fact and, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's basically been the story, and you would think at that time I would have learned, but there was a lot of mental coaches that I had talked with, visited with, and had exercises that I was supposed to do, and I just... I didn't always just, you know, keep it up and, and keep the, it's almost like the new year's resolution. And what I talked about in that is po- a podcast. You kind of, you know what you got to do and you're like, okay, I'm going to do it. And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, you're like, ah, <laughs> haven't really followed through on these things. But, um, but I mean, I, like I said, I really wanted to, um, you know, thank you as a part of, of the Indians, but also not being, you could have easily been as someone like, all right, I'm going to figure this out by myself and I'm going to be the person who cheers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, if you think about it and look at it a little bit, cause I was doing a lot of research, even when I was down in Akron in 2017, looking up YouTube videos, doing everything I could, uh, which was a lot easier to do when I was by myself. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but <clears throat> the things I found is cause there was a thing going around about Charles Barkley's golf swing. And I didn't know that he used to look good and play golf. Well, just because I only saw his golf swing and there were a lot of people were making fun and it was like a, on a sports center, like not top 10 and stuff like that. And it made me think once I saw like the story, when I researched in 2017, I was like, Oh my gosh, this is horrible. What he had to go through. Um, mm-hmm. Luckily that wasn't his profession, but he went from being, you know, a good golfer where he could bet with Michael Jordan, Larry Bird and all them to, like a, a case where he tried hip, uh, hypnotism and all that. And it's just, it, it's crazy because uh, I, now I think we've made some progress where, where if that would happen right now, I think it'd be a different story, but that that's part of the reason that a lot of us are afraid to admit or don't want to be, make it real because of the, the stigma and the, just the, the sheer embarrassment <laughs> that we have to go through. Yeah. So well, I think, you know, okay, simplest thing, right? Throw a ball from A to B. Like you probably play catch with your kids. Yep. And I, and so I do think, I think that exists of just the pure kind of shock and embarrassment of how can I not do the most basic thing or I'm now scared to do the most basic thing. Yes. And then I also think, um, again, there's, there's an aura around it. And so I feel like almost every spring training, there would be someone that had an off throwing day. And sometimes that turned into a throwing problem. And sometimes it was nothing, but oftentimes as a mental performance coach, people would come in off the field and you'd start to get, you know, Oh, do you need to talk to so-and-so? You did. It was not a good day to catch today. <laughs> and you and I talked about this. There was a feeling of like, Hey, let it be a bad day and let it settle. Let's not, let's not start sending off alarm bells because there's such a narrative behind yips that, the minute those around you start to freak out, even if you didn't have them, maybe you do now because yeah. what shouldn't have been traumatizing <laughs> has become pretty traumatizing and you yes. weren't traumatized by it, but everyone else was. Yes. Um, uh. And there is a feeling of just, we don't know how to fix it. I mean, I think it's even the panic. If you think about right now in COVID, like if we knew all the different ways you could get it in exactly what the that was. And we felt like all like the statistics, no matter which way you roll are totally accurate. And we, we felt like we understood the progression and how we were going to work through this and when there might be a vaccine, we would probably be acting completely differently, but there's so many unknowns that it keeps people on edge and fearful and probably making claims, you know, either way that, that, um, we don't know, we're not true. We're, we're just, it's fear driven. And I think there's a component, um, both culturally within baseball, and certainly for the player that there's just a lot of fear driven components to it. And that makes, that's a whole nother layer that you're trying to work with on the mental side <laughs> yes. um, is the aura or the narrative of yips, not even the person and the actual issue they're having. Yeah. And your expertise and you being willing to come on and uh, you know, being in North Carolina and just, you know, obviously we hadn't spoken in a while, so it was good that we were able to catch up before this. And just instead of being like, "Hey, how are you doing?" It's easy. This will be the first <laughs> time. Um, I I really appreciate you, you know, coming on and uh, taking out the time just to, you know, obviously reminisce uh, on the great times that we shared, and <laughs> and just uh, you know, like I said, share your knowledge uh, with people, and hopefully, if it sparks someone. Um, it'd be great in the next month or whatever to even if maybe if they're not having an issue, but or, or they're in the denial stage, maybe it helps them like, OK, this is a real thing. I probably should address it or to just say, it, OK, there's different ways to look at this or 
maybe someone's just like going through it and they don't know what to think like when I first was so maybe this could help them but the one thing I do like about this is this is going to be you know on YouTube forever so you never know when it's going to help somebody um, but I think it's very important that you came hey, in here and maybe I can have you on here some more <laughs> yes can I can I reverse roles on you real quick uh -oh. one of the things you talked about this morning that I think is an important thing to to say, especially if you think about someone else going through this, is the support. You talked about support from players. Oh, yeah. um, and I know you hinted at this earlier, but I yeah. actually think that that's a really cool component of something that I think for from a community standpoint that probably helped take away some of the stigma. Do yes. you mind talking a little bit about that? No, I, I totally forgot. I get sidetracked, you know, ask my wife. Um, <laughs> well, the main thing, so people in Tuscross County, and I think – on Bauer's uh, The Momentum YouTube channel, they talked about this because uh, Shaw was just on the Bauer Bites thing and he talked about how people in Ohio just hate Brian Shaw. And I've experienced that and I'm just like, the people in my hometown are like, oh, and I'm like, what are you talking about? And I got to know him and I'm just like, he's a good dude. He's good at baseball. Like, what do you, why do you guys not like him so much? And um, and this is going to be great because he was, obviously there was, there was Andrew Miller, Cody Allen, um, you know, even Cody Anderson, you know, even though he wasn't always up with a big club, we know you should have been there. But, but despite injuries, um, there was guys like Danny Salazar, you know, even Kluber, like there was just everybody was always, you know, there was never that that I didn't I've never felt like I was Charles Barkley and people are laughing at me uh, for one, which was huge. And then the people who went extra miles like Cody Allen would always, you know, talk to me like before or after catch like bring me in the stands and just we just have a one-on-one -on -one conversation sort of like this and that meant a lot just for these guys you know they have routines um you know they got stuff they got to do and they're willing to, to sit down with me and i've been there for a month um it just showed you know what type of team we had and just like what we were talking about when we first started the show you know the family um i guess uh dynamic we had with the indians and but with Shaw, man, he took it to a, another level just because a guy of his stature, being all the all the money he had and how great he is as a, a baseball player, despite what Tuscarawas County in Ohio thinks, <laughs> um, he easily could have just said, you know what, I'm going to find another throwing partner. You know, this guy has no idea. I'm not trying to get hurt out here. I don't want to keep chasing balls that he's throwing over my head. Uh, but instead, he made a point to show me that, look, uh, you know, I, it doesn't matter who I am. Like I care about you as a person and I want to help you get through this uh, no matter what. And he would, we tried everything, throw the football. We, we tried a lot of stuff and um, it just, it meant a lot for the organization and for the players to really just, you know, take a liking to me and try to help me out as much as they could. And I would assume that's because of, you know, of what Tito said um, about me being all smiles and stuff and everyone knew what type of person I was. So, you know, just like you said, I was easy to cheer for. Um, I hope that was the reason and that, you know, I just, I love all those players for that. And when people try to ask me who's my favorite player on the team, that's really hard to answer. Um, but I would say, you know, Shaw is up there. But when they're, they try to tell me, you know, who's the who's the biggest a-hole in the team, like I literally could not pick one person where I'm like, I hate to be around that guy. You know, <laughs> like everyone on the team was like, you know, good, you know, ex except mm -hmm. the, the guys who didn't talk as much, you know, <laughs> like Crockett. But no, Crockett would talk to me a lot. Him and Merritt, they once they opened up with me because we started hanging out off the field. Uh, but not everyone can be like Kipnis. So... <laughs> I don't know if everyone yeah, wants to yeah, be like so true. this. <laughs> but no, It'd be very I, yeah. loud plane rides if everyone was like Kipnis. Yes, yes. But uh, I do, I'm, I appreciate you bringing that back up because I think that is important, just like you said. And I did want to share that. So, uh, but yeah, is that, is that, did I cover? Was that, was that what you were yeah. looking for? Okay. No, I just, I know that that was a big piece that you talked about this morning. And I do think that um, support is a huge aspect because I, I believe that, you know, you're facing down a fear and when it feels like people are in your corner, I think it gives you the best shot of that fight. And I think that was the amazing thing that the Indians organization could bring 
to what you were working through is you had a lot of people behind you and you earned a lot of people behind you, Percy. Yeah. Um, but I think it also speaks to the caliber of the individuals that are part of the organization. So, yeah, I was um, going to say they, they definitely, even when they, re- they reached out to me last year uh, to come out and see maybe if there's a, uh, something I can do with them and, you know, maybe start a career with the Indians. I mean, it didn't work out, but the fact that they were, they reached out to me and said, Hey, um, you know, the way we run our organization is we, we find good people and then we try to figure out a spot where they can work for us. So, yep. um, that, that meant a lot for, for me, uh, for them to reach out to me and say, Hey, you know, you're a type of person we would love to have on our staff. And, uh, it, it unfortunately didn't work out, but you know, I was definitely trying to figure out my way. It was a lot of car trouble going on, but I figured out a way to get up there. <laughs> <laughs> but um but no i appreciate having you on cc maybe we'll have you on again later down the road we see how long this thing goes you know <laughs> i mean i'm enjoying I this and I, I i love it you said you you would love to be back i would love to be back one of the things actually and you may have actually been a start for me on this percy of i started paying a lot of attention to players and particularly like very talented players how much identity got tied into success on a baseball field and how hard it was on some level to detangle that. And one of the things that I think I shocked Mike Chernoff at one point with is like, I want to spend a bunch of time with the first round draft picks, not because they're first round draft picks, because I'm actually scared. They have the highest chance of kind of breaking, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, The expectations are so high and they're so, you know, they've been signing autographs since they were 14 and um, 40% of first round draft picks. Uh, this was true at least a couple of years ago. Don't step on a major league field for a day. And yet we're so sure about them at 18 or 21. And so yeah. we actually got a chance. And again, Indians, awesome organization to bring six players, six minor league guys down here to North Carolina and do land navigation with them. Wow. And Matt compass and protractor and two special ops guys helped us out. Um, and, um, yeah, Mark Allen came down and, uh, Jake, All they right. were awesome. And, um, <laughs> And we focused on how do you learn a new skill, uh, especially when it's not in baseball and there's no ego involved. What happens when you hit a challenge or an obstacle? And what's kind of your journey through that? How do you resolve that? And we loved land navigation because you're moving from point A to point B and you're doing it alone. And just like on a baseball field, you're alone on that mound. People can talk to you, but no one can fix it for you. Or you're alone in a batter's box. And you, you end up talking to yourself a lot from point A to point B, you've got to make sure you're staying on path and um, you're hoping you're doing things right. But there's always some point where you can't look back to where you were and you're not yet where you're going. And so the self-talk, the confidence, the chance to kind of get to know who you are in those moments away from a baseball field, um, I started feeling like we're so important. And so we started something called the, the all terrain project. Um, and you can actually find it online. Oh, really? Um, all okay. terrain, yeah, alltrainproject.com. Um, and started kind of, and you'll see some of the guys you recognize. All and right. um, all right. But starting to give high performers a chance, um, if, if it's not baseball even, to get away and kind of get back in touch with um, who you are. How do you learn a new thing? What happens when challenges occur? How do you work through them? And providing a setting where it's not your livelihood. Um, and the woods in North Carolina aren't so bad. So um, I think you were part of that for me is just recognizing that the human underneath it all, like I don't think you can separate the person who walks in in their jeans and a t-shirt from the person that puts on a uniform. You don't, you don't flip a switch. Yeah. I don't think the best performers do. I think you bring everything of who you are onto that field. Um, and so we can't ignore it. We can't ignore the human. I like that. So thank you. No problem. But appreciate having you uh, on uh, CC again. And uh, again, I'll reach out to you um, uh, and see when we can connect again. Um, Sounds good. Yes. But I appreciate everybody who's tuning in uh, again. Um, like and subscribe, like the YouTuber say. And uh, uh, you can catch us again on the next episode. Thank you. Shawty, you my little mama. I got a crib out of water. Save me, Casa, Sue, Casa. It feels like Casa, London. Shawty.